We're going to do this in a few seconds, yeah? Uh, first of all, thank you so much, and I, I, I've said this a hundred times, thank you, uh, Shindy, for inspiring us to do this, for bringing all of you here. This happened, I think this whole thing started six weeks ago. I'd like to do an advisor conference. Where? How? With what money? <laughs> Who's coming? Anyways, amazing. We're here, we're doing it. We still don't have the money, but it's amazing. <laughs> and uh, it's great. Well, we got hard time. And, <laughs> yeah, I called the national office. I said, uh, this is before we have, of course, we want to welcome Debbie Stone from New York and Dan Hazoni from New York. And who else came in this morning? And everybody else, but Mark, I, I called the national office. I said, listen, I'm going to do this thing in Toronto. It's very important. We do these maple leaf tours. We do these training sessions, professional development for regional directors, for associate regional directors, for city directors. I want to do this thing uh, for advisors, Chinese idea. So I said, fine, but you have to take Mark Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Deal! <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> Her name is Ethel. She survives the Holocaust. She actually, during the, th the time of the Holocaust, she was a young student. She goes through terrible atrocities. I'm not here to expand on that. Use your imagination. She eventually lives, she's ghettoized, she eventually escapes. She ends up in, as a fighting in, in uh, as a young teenager, as a partisan. She survives in the forest for a couple of years. She makes it out, survives, gets into a DP camp for three years. At the end of the three years or so, in her late teens or early 20s maybe, late teens, she meets a young man who equally survived the Holocaust through the most incredible miracles, through suffering, through devastation, through loss. They meet, they marry, they come to the shores of America, they start a new life together. They want to build Jewish homes. They want to have Bais Neman Israel, And they start to raise their children. They send them to Jewish schools, whatever there was in the 1940s and the 1950s. And they have the occasional holiday and the beautiful Shabbos once in a while. And they give their kids a real love of what it means to be Jewish, how they struggled for their Judaism. Ethel has four children, and I think it's six or seven grandchildren, and she celebrates Christmas with two of her children. She survives the Holocaust, she marries, she raises her kids Jewish, because she knows it's the only way. But today, on December 25th, she goes to her son's house, who married Christina, and there they celebrate Christmas together around the table where they carve up a non-kosher turkey and give presents and toys to her goyish grandchildren. Ah, oh, what nachas. <laughs> Thank you, great reaction. <laughs> that picked it up. <laughs> In 1970, when I was um, crawling on the ground in my diapers, the intermarriage rate in North America was 17%, 17%. You should know, by the way, in 19, um, before the Holocaust, the, the intermarriage rate was 9%. There's always been an issue. It's not like it's new. We didn't start the fire. It's always been like that. Jews married out. Today, the intermarriage rate, the latest study, the Pew study that just came out, if you remove the orthodox equ equ equation, which is 0%, 0% of within orthodox Jews intermarry, because by the time they intermarry, they're usually not orthodox, uh, generally. But we have that issue too. We could talk about it another time. Today, that number is 71%. That means from the time I was born 
to right now in my, my life, 44 years later, that number has inverted itself from 17 to 71 percent. Now, we do nothing. Nothing, that number is going to increase. If we do everything, that number is going to increase. But that does not mean we should not try. And it doesn't mean that we're going to save the whole wide world. And it doesn't mean we're going to stop and do everything and everybody's going to be from and, and we're going to bring Mashiach because of our efforts and we hope that we do. But I don't know about the grandiose world. I don't know about the whole of all Kleistral. I don't know about Mashiach. But I know that if there's one kid in front of me who will be one day a father or a mother, and maybe one day they will marry, and one day they too will have four children, I don't want them to be celebrating Christmas with their grandchildren. And that is something you and I can fix. You can fix that, and I can fix that. As best as I, we can, with Rebona Shalom's help. But there's something we can do. Not about the whole wide world, but you're going to be faced with opportunities to make a difference in families and individuals that will change the life, the scope, the trajectory of families. And if it hurts you to hear Ethel's story, it should give you nachas to hear the stories that we're hopefully going to discuss over the course of the day of those who found their place and their, commi their communities because of NCSY, because of other cure organizations, because they, because they found spirituality. I'm going to show you this video in a second that we produced, just, just one second, but I want to tell you something. Kiruv is a hidden mitzvah. Avas Yisrael, Tochech Techech Et Amisecha, Shavas Aveda, Finding a Lost Soul. There are many, many mitzvahs. In fact, there's books on books on the mitzvahs. But it really is a hidden mitzvah. It's a hidden mitzvah. What I mean by that is, at the end of the day, if people like us, frankly, if people like me, do not go out there into the Jewish community and push and push and push and make it an, an issue, make it an, a, a priority and say, don't give your money to that Holocaust study place, which is very important. That's yesterday's crisis. And don't give that money to that museum. That's important, but who cares? And don't give your money only to that hospital because somebody else will give money to that hospital. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But if we don't go out there and tell people to support initiatives like this, guess what happens to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Jews? They are forgotten about. Balabatim, donors, supporters, community, it's not that important. It's not that important. And our hero, heroes, hero and heroine, is Avraham and Sarah, a completely devoid community, a world that could not care less about spirituality. In the dawn of time, at sunrise, comes an incredible couple, a power couple, that's what they call it today, a power couple who build a house in a place where nobody would go, and they were rejected. The rabbis tell us that they actually went to Egypt, and in Egypt, which was the New York City of the, of the time, totally rejected them. They said, I will not quit. They built their, their house on a thoroughfare where people would travel, and they said, come to me. Nobody cared. Nobody was interested. There was no godliness. There was no spirituality. There was just Avraham, and there was Sarah, and they said, it matters to me, and therefore it will matter to the world. It's hidden. If it doesn't matter to you, it will matter to no one. And many of you are the products of people like me and others that have been around before you. I use me as an example of old people, okay? That's all I mean. Who took the time and said, how can I help the person in front of me? And now you're here standing, sitting, and saying, how can I help the next generation? That is the power of Avraham and Sarah. That is the power of what we're trying to talk about here. And if you don't think it's important, nobody will think it's important. There are not 500 people that want to sit in this room. There just aren't. There aren't. 
I don't think there are 35 people who are full-time to carve them. And Adrian Gold, by the way, is in the room. I want to introduce her for one second. What a powerful, powerful personality. I, I, you're going to hear from her a little later, right? So I won't do it much now. But Adrian is, uh, I would say, one of the greatest role models, um, one of the greatest speak speakers in the city, sought-out lecturer, and um, a person who's taken um, a lifelong commitment to Kirov to change her life and everybody around her. And Adrian, would you agree that less than 35 people in Toronto, full-time Kira people? Much less. Much less, right? We have 20 people in our office. We're the largest in NCSY in North America and probably the largest Kira thing in North America. And, uh, we, are, we are the largest office and we have n almost nobody. There's not that much. That's why you're here. Because we cannot do this alone. It's impossible. It's a hidden mitzvah. If we don't perpetuate it, if we don't scream it from the, from the mountaintops, nobody cares. Nobody cares if I stop going to people's homes. <laughs> Hi, it's Glenn Black from NCSY. Would you mind meeting me? Uh, yeah, I do mind meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't do that and 50 other people like me don't do that, you know what happens? <clears throat> nobody cares. No buildings like this. This whole building is designed for that. No one cares. Somebody in a room 20 years ago, 30 years ago, said, I can make a difference. I want to show you a video, and I'm going to tell you some stories. If you could hit the lights, that would be great. It's a video clapping for 58% intermarriage late, but uh, I don't know why you're clapping, I'm just joking. Last night I spoke to you about uh, Yosef Mendelevich, how he uh, tried to keep semblance of Shabbos in his prison cell in the Siberian Gulag, but I want to share with you just a quick thought about Natan Sharansky, who is the head of the uh, Sochnut of the Jewish Agency in Israel, who was a famous, famous um, refusenik and eventually made his way to Eretz Yisrael, started a party, uh, did amazing things uh, with his life. Um, and they asked him once at a synagogue, he came to speak in Toronto at the Shar Shemayim Synagogue, I don't know if anybody was here for that. <laughs> Can I continue? Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> technology is not my thing. I think my, I, I don't, I, I think my heart, like my, my heart pace, what's that thing called? Pacemaker. Pacemaker in my heart is going to go off, but I don't, actually don't have one. <laughs> so I never know. It's something beeping on me. Um, so he's, he's sitting in a, uh, in a, in a, he came here and spoke at Shar Shemayim and they, they, somebody asked him, or I think he just said, somebody once asked him, you know, like, you're in this prison, they basically tell you, you're a garbage can. Israel hates you. Israel won, lost every battle against the Arabs. There's no more Israel. You've been fighting to go to some country that doesn't even exist. No one's rallying for you. No one cares about you. It's over. And they actually used to do, um, they used to give material of, of falsified newspapers. They made newspapers with false information um, so that Jews would get the wrong message. They completely lied. Like they're doing now in Crimea. But they, uh, they, uh, that's still on. Um, so the, so uh, the, he said to them, you know, how did you not ever give up? How did you not give up? Like, your whole fight was that you wanted to go there to Israel. The whole fight was that you wanted to be Jewish. The whole fight was that you wanted to, to be part of Kalei Israel. Mm -hmm. so he said that I knew, no matter what they told me, no matter what they showed me, I knew that the Jewish people would never, ever give up on me. They would never give up on me. And I knew that if the Jewish people would never give up on me, I would never give up on myself. <coughs> we, in Kiruv, that's what really, ultimately, I know we don't like that word, really, not, we're fine. but we, those of us in the business of Ava Sisrael, in Talmud Torah, Harbatzah's Torah, our price is to not give up on these kids, on the families that we're involved with, because if we give up, they will give up on themselves. And I think that's an, a really important message. So that's what we're here to talk about. I'm going to leave you a, quick, a couple quick thoughts, and, and I'll move on to the more important uh, speakers and, and programs. Um, when you're, when the title of this class is called The Lifelong Journey in Kiruv, or of Kiruv, I don't remember what he says. But, um, I'll tell you, from my, in my life, I've been doing this for um, about, 20, 22, 20, about 25 years. I started off as an advisor. 
Actually, uh, I was in, I went to Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, and I actually never even heard of Etsy when I was in Israel. I had no idea what that was, but I had interactions with non from Israelis, and I couldn't believe how secular and how, um, how vastly uneducated they were about the Jewish people. And frankly, I met a lot of people who were about to go into the army, or even were in the army, who had no idea what they were fighting for. What is it? You know, I guess you're fighting for your house. I get that. You're fighting for your property. I get that. You're fighting so you don't die, but there's such a bigger issue here. Kla Yisrael, B'nai Yisrael, history, God's land. They didn't understand any of that stuff. And I started to speak to them and talk to them and say, okay, there's so much more here, and I couldn't believe it. And I realized when I grew up in, in uh, and I went to, he I grew up in Montreal, Hebrew Academy, and there I, I actually never knew that many non from people, and I knew non from people, but they weren't them, and there was us, and I went to the kosher restaurants, they didn't, and that was the end of that. There was no, I could help you, or you could help me, and our relationship could be amazing, and I can, in, I can introduce you to something, and, and we can grow together. Like, it, was not, it wasn't like that. I didn't think in those terms. I went to YU, and there I heard a lot more about NCSY. I got involved in junior NCSY in New Jersey. That was a, I regret that, but uh, <laughs> that, that is how it started. I did not enjoy those times. Uh, but I, 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 did, I was introduced to NCSY then, and when I, I moved to Montreal for a year, and I became the NCSY director here um, uh, in, in Montreal, uh, in a shul, and then I went back to YU, because there actually was an NCSY, just on, another, just on a personal note, and it was actually an NCSY that I was, I want to say it was McCart, but on a certain level I was. We were at Yarchikala, um, at a three-day uh, Shabbaton in a, in a hotel, and I used to do a session in my younger years, which was at the end of Yarchikal on the Motzi Shabbos, before they leave on Sunday, and have what next? Like, you went through this process on Thursday, and on Friday, and on Shabbos, and now you're going to go home tomorrow. What, what can you expect when you go home? What are you going to tell your parents? How are you going to keep Shabbos? What about tefillin? How are you keep dressing this? How are you going to light Shabbos candles? What do you do now with all this stuff we just told you? Because we, like, blew your mind. Now what? So myself, a guy named Ian, and a guy named uh, 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 Lyle, we stayed up all night. It was started at, after the comes like midnight, and it went till six, seven o'clock in the morning. We we dubbed with the kids, and that was the end of the Yarkikala. Seven, eight hours. What next? So I don't know if anybody in that room was McCarved. I have no idea. But Lyle became Rabbi Yehuda Leib uh, um, um, Yellen, who is a big time uh, Rebbe. Rosh Hashiva and Eretz Yisrael, who was at McGill University, director of NCSY at the time. And he, his, actually my son, randomly, who was learning at Tomo, randomly went to his house for Shabbos uh, less than a month ago. It just because he was in uh, Kirit, Mo oh, not Kirit Moshe, whatever, I don't know the name of the area he lives in. That's unbelievable. Ian, Ian was also a car of that night. His name is Rabbi Yitz Lerner. Girls know that name? Yeah, Rabbi, from, from uh, not from Shosh, Yudrasha Rachel. He speaks at a lot of the other yeshivas. Every time I mention his name, people pick up, pick up, pick up, uh, pick up his name. And, uh, and then myself, sadly, I stayed in NCSY. But the other guys, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, whatever. But the point is, who were we really, who, who was saved in that room? It wasn't, I, don't, I hope we got the kids, but for sure, we were inspired ourselves. And we grew so much from that experience. And that's a lot of why I'm here today, because I am in search of that moment myself. I'm constantly in search for that. When I was 16 years old, I went to something called a Torah Leadership Seminar, which was run by Yeshiva Universities before NCSY. I didn't even know NCSY. I was 16 years old. My parents put me on a bus to New York City. I have no I, I feel so bad when I see these kids get on a bus and they wave to their parents. They're never going to see them again. <laughs> you know? But don't worry, we have Danishes. And everyone's walking on the bus with Danishes. Yeah, we're not culty. And, it was the, and, <laughs> and I got on this bus on my, by myself. I, didn't, I don't think I remember. I went maybe with two other friends. I can't remember. And it was, it was fantastic. And I met all these guys and all these girls just looked, felt, looked like that. She's why I walked to the, into a room. Once I was, I was hanging out with girls on the side. I have no idea what was going on. And I, the guy, one guy comes over to me and he says, I want you to come see this room. So I have no idea. Room. What's going on? So I had no idea. Brings me into a room. There's a band. Now, you don't know this band, but I mean, you might have heard of them, but in those days, they were like very big and they were very new. They were called Schlock Rock. <laughs> How embarrassing is that? So I, I walk in, there's Schlock Rock. Lenny Solomon is playing some really bad song <laughs> that sounded like a very bad song 20 years earlier. You know how they do that? And I walk in, and I had never seen anything more beautiful. 
There were 200 kids sitting on the ground. There were candles all over the floor. The room was totally dark. He was playing some Kumsitz music. I, I grew up modern orthodox. I have no idea. I've never seen anything like this in my life. And they're singing Jewish songs voluntarily because <laughs> I wasn't in the room. And I wasn't in the room with like five or ten other girls and guys. But they were in the room. And he put his arm on my shoulder. And we just looked at this thing. That guy's name is Shalom Baum. Anybody here from, uh, anybody know Rabbi Shalom Baum? Today? You know that name? Big time. From, uh, he's from uh, Connecticut, I think. Romer. Romer. Okay. Big, big rub today. He was an advisor to NCSY at the time. He put his arm on my shoulder, brought me into a room, and he just showed me something without making any, without saying anything. I want you to know that one of the only reasons, and I remember that moment, I was 16, 17 years old, I would say that one of the reasons I am in Kirov today was because of that moment. Every decision I have ever made in my life has brought me back to that moment. And as, as I search for that moment in my life, to, to relive that moment, I realize that it's not good enough to have that moment alone. That if I'm successful, I can bring thousands of people to that moment. That's why I do what I do. That's why my whole strategy in NCSY, the way I operate, is I don't do anything alone. That's why we have 65 and, uh, full-time and part-time staff in NCSY. That's why we have multiple offices across Canada. That's why I travel around North America helping other NCSY uh, regions develop. Because I believe that that moment, if it changed me, it can change others. And it didn't take Torah, and it didn't take spirituality. It took somebody who took me by the hand, showed me something powerful. And he didn't know, and I didn't know. But something remarkable happened in that room. Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted that shidduch to happen right there between my neshama and that moment. And because of that, every decision I've ever made, has, I have been trying my best to bring myself back to that place. Every moment. So I think that's what we do. You have a spiritual moment in your life. You believe in Torah. You believe in spirituality. You believe in, in, in bringing people closer to Yiddishkeit. It's not good enough that you feel it. It's our chryas to help others feel it also. And God willing, when you get married, there's going to be a lot of you who are going to say, well, you know, now I have children, and it's not so good to have kids influenced by all these non from people. And they're going to come to the house, and they're going to use their cell phones, and they're going to dress not sneezely, and they're going to use language that you cannot believe, and it's totally inappropriate, and it's terrible, and it's not going to be a good thing for our family. But I want you to know and you have to know your family, and you have to know your husband or your wife, and you have to know your children, and you have to know the environment, but in general, as a rule, the greatest thing you can do for your children is to show them people who are searching. It's the greatest thing you'll ever do. I, 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 I'm just one family, I'm just one father, but I checked it with my wife. I said, can I say this? She said, yeah, you can say this. And most of the schuss in our family has beca is because Whatever miracles that have occurred, they have a miracles that have occurred because of the work that we have done. And actually, I use this uh, to Bartora when I, well, this quick thought of this measure, actually, we honored Adrian Gold a couple of years ago, this beautiful saying. I, I wrote it down. I wanted to share with you all today. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu Adam Hazeb, Neri Biyadcha Venercha Biyadi. HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to, I guess, Adam, my candle is in your hands. And your candle is in my hands. Neri biyadcha, the candle that is in your hand, zu Torah. That's our Torah. That's the Torah. I'm giving you my ner, my candle. That's the Torah. I'm giving that to you. Nercha biyadi, your candle is in my hands. What's that? Zu hanefesh. That's the soul. Im shamaris es neri, if you protect and guard my candle, my light. I will protect and guard your light. If you take care of Hashem's precious children, Hashem will take care of your children. I think that is an incredibly powerful and important thing to say right now because sometimes people get involved as advisors 
And then they pull out. They say, okay, I'm done. I did my thing. I want you to know today's opening here is that there is an opportunity for a lifelong commitment to Kirov that doesn't have to be stopped by marriage, doesn't have to be stopped by children, doesn't have to be stopped because there's not a job, doesn't have to be stopped for any reason. Kaleisrael needs the people in this room. Hashem needs the people in this room. There's no question. You can't quit. You can't stop. You can't say, well, now I'm doing this, or now I'm doing that. You found it so that a university is not an impotent, impetus to, to not be able to do this. You, found, you find that when, you're, when you're, you make a job some day, every single one of you who came from out of town, and some of you from in town, stayed in some homes. They opened their houses over Shabbos to you, to, to have you over for a Shabbos, because they want to give you that experience, and they want to give you that Shabbos. And all those people, by the way, that you're housed by are involved in NCSY in some capacity. Almost every single family. Either they're donors, or they have Shabbos meals for somebody, or they're chavrusas with people. They're all engaged. They found a way. That is such an important thing. And I'll leave you with one last thought. We're out of here. Although I have 12 more pages. <laughs> it says like this. The Medr- Mishnah, everybody knows this. Al Shloshat Varim HaVolam HaMed. Al Torah V'Avodah V'Agmulah Chassadim. On Torah V'Avodah V'Agmulah Chassadim. On Torah, learning Torah, al Avoda, on the personal pursuit of spirituality, of davening, of, of personal growth, and V'Agmulah Chassadim on, on Chassad. So if you, you know that the, each of the avos are correspond to each of those words. So Torah is Yaakov, Avodah is Yitzchak, and Gilch Sanah is Avraham. So it's reversed. It's reversed. It should be the opposite. You should say, really talk about Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Just like I said, why is it ya- uh, Yaakov, Yitzchak, and Avraham? So the answer, I mean, there's many, many reasons, but there's a reverse order for a reason. That if you don't have your own personal growth as a factor in this, then you're going to ultimately fail. It has to start with Torah, personally, in your own life. It has to be something that is so true, so real, that it's overflowing from you. It's not that you have information that you give over. The way it works is that you take a cup and you fill it with wine. And you fill it and you fill it. And as it overflows, it fills all the other cups of wine. It's not that it's, you've cup, you're filling a lot of cups with one bottle. And you get another body. No, it's overflow experience. You can have the Gemilu Chassad, I mean, you could do the Chassad, and you could do the Avoda. There's nothing wrong with your own personal development. It's, pers- it's fantastic. But if you don't spend your time on your own Torah growth and the pursuit of that growth for yourself, you will never really make it as a whole Jew in this world and forget about the fact that you can give it over. I'm going to tell you something very sharp right now, which I, I don't want to end with, but I'm going to have to end because we're out of time. Do not come to NCSY to find your spiritual growth. It's a big mistake. It's a failure. You will find some spiritual growth in NCSY, but it's not what you should be doing. This is where it overflows. This is where the joy and the simcha and the Torah and the spirituality emerges from you. Not where you come and take it. Because if you're taking it, you cannot be giving at the same time. And there are many kids here who are trying to take it also. And if you're taking it, and they're taking it, and you're both sitting at the table, and you're both thinking, oh, it's such a great song, it's a great song, and you're both singing, and you're both learning the benching, benching at the same time, and all of that, who's, talk, who's helping that kid? Who's making sure that person's okay? You're too busy to take care of you. You cannot be taking care of you in NCSY. I know it's stark, stark and it's too, maybe it's too sharp, but it is absolutely healthy. What I'm saying to you, it's a prescription for a healthy Kiruv experience and a healthy Jewish experience. Find your spirituality elsewhere, and you will be a rock star as an advisor. But if you find your spirituality in NCSY, you have not made the transition from giver, from taker to giver. That's a huge error. It's not what we want. Find a chavrusa outside of NCSY. Don't just make your learning with NCSY kids. Find a way to learn online. Get a rub that it does not work for NCSY. Get Piske Halacha from other people. Travel along to other places and find out how they do what they do in life, in Kiruv. Find role models that are not NCSY. We're okay, we're good. But this should not be your whole life. It isn't mine. It isn't even mine. I don't get my spiritual. You can ask anybody any day of the week. Ask anybody if I like my job. Who, where's Shmuel? Do I like my job? <laughs> I do not 
No, I don't like my job. I'll tell you what I mean. I love my job. I love my job. But I'd give it up in a second if there was somebody better, something else, whatever that is. I don't find in NCSY, like I don't go to Shabbaton, people say, do you love the Shabbaton? Yeah, it's okay. Because as long as you're giving and you're pushing yourself and you're giving yourself, I'm not filled up by that. I don't get filled up by the Avdallah. I don't get filled up by the Ebbings. I don't get filled up by the Shurim. I don't. I got filled up this morning at Daf Yomi. Saw some guys. I ran to Daf Yomi this morning. I got to learn. It's not the greatest. Okay, it's 40 minutes, whatever it is. But I had no time. I had the beer. But the point is, they, <laughs> that you find your spirituality elsewhere. It's such an important yisod. And it's such an important thing for your own personal growth. Judaism, Jews are an endangered species. We simply are. We're endangered. <laughs> you look around, people are worried about whales, and they're worried about seals, <laughs> and they're worried about, I, I don't know what, vegan things, I don't know. <laughs> but we are an endangered species. Ooh. And the greatest thing you can do for the endangered species is A, like an airplane, Whenever, God forbid, I don't want to use an analogy in today's day, but <laughs> when there's a crisis on an airplane, what they say to you is if you have traveling with a child, first take the oxygen mask and put it on yourself, and then put the oxygen mask on the child. Because if you take care of them only, you will die. You will not be able to survive. You cannot help yourself. You have to be able to help yourself, and then you can help others. I, I just, I, that's my bracha. My bracha is that every single one of us should find the opportunities to be spiritually, spiritual giants. That it's not, you don't have to, so that your, that your personalities, that your actions, that what you do and how you do it will live beyond your moments. When Shalom Baum brought me to that room, he didn't say a word. All he said was, look at what can be. That changed my life. Look at the kid. See what could be and change their lives. Thank you.